Uh, my name is Marco Palladino. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Kong. I'll, uh, I'll spend a few words at the end to explain what Kong is. So today we're going to be talking about blowing up the monolith, moving to distributed systems in order to modernize our architecture. I like to say that modernizing the enterprise, modernizing our architectures, it's really like going from a single cell to a multicellular organism. Our systems are becoming complex organisms. Our organizations are becoming complex organisms. Different teams, different products, different business cases to be made. And each one of them will have its own technological answer. Decoupled, distributed, self-filling. Our softwares are becoming as decoupled as the teams within the enterprise. The journey is a journey across different architectures. So today we're going to be focusing on the journey from monolithic applications to microservices. But really, there are like lots of in-between steps, right? It can be a handful of large code bases, monoliths, where primarily the traffic, it's north-south traffic on the network to access those monoliths, to SOA or mini services like Gartner calls them, to microservices and service mesh, and so on and so forth, even with pockets of adoption of serverless. Now, the biggest difference between the left side of this picture and the right side of this picture is that on the left side, information is primarily either in use or at rest. The more we move to the right side, the more we decouple our system, we introduce a new state for our information, for our data. Information is more and more in flight the more we decouple and distribute our systems. And the fact that information is more and more in flight determines a new set of challenges that we didn't have before. So be, before we actually look at the technical aspects of this transition, what does it even mean to modernize our systems? Like, why are we doing it? What's the main criteria that determines how far we should go? I really like this definition. Uh, refactoring a monolith is, uh, is an activity that unlocks team productivity and business scalability. The keywords here are team productivity and business scalability. Anything that doesn't achieve these goals then becomes quickly an academic project because it's not helping the team and it's not helping the business. Microservices, although we are hearing a lot about them today or these days. They're not a new concept. Companies like Amazon, like Netflix, like Google, obviously they've done that transition a long time ago. But there was a business case that was driving this transition. Netflix had to move from one country to multiple countries. They had to support, you know, from going from one device to multiple device. And so from a business requirement standpoint, their monolith was not scalable enough to allow them to unlock their business goals. And so they transitioned to microservices in order to do that. The business is the driver, right? So how can we unlock the scalability of our systems in order to, to achieve better and greater things? And so they moved to microservices. And, uh, and Amazon did the same. They were selling books. They were going to a place where they wanted to sell everything else, expand. And so they moved to microservices. So what is the criteria or what is the goal? And what is really the, also the key result within the organization that determines if the teams should be approaching this transition? And so the second question is, should we do it? Moving to, uh, you know, regardless of where we stand in the hype cycle of new technologies, right? Moving to microservices, it's fundamentally a harder, uh, it's a harder task they're just managing a monolith. The monolith might be blocking our systems, might be blocking our business, but all things considered, it's easy to manage. We deploy it the same way, we run it the same way, we only have one code base, and so on and so forth. Transitioning to microservices is an increase of complexity within our architecture, because we're going to be running not one system, but n systems. It's going to be hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe in one cloud, in multi-cloud, containers. And whatever we do, we're still going to be having legacy monoliths that are going to be so hard to decouple that most likely will never be decoupled. And so Amazon, Netflix, to go back to my original examples, they've done it. 
but they obviously increase significantly the complexity of their infrastructure. In their teams, the organization itself had to adapt to run in this specific way. Transitioning to microservices, it's not just a technical transition. It's an organizational and operational transition. The way our teams are going to be working together, the way our teams are going to be releasing new products is going to change. And because it takes so long to transition to microservices, because it's such a fundamental transformative transition, the organization has to be on board with this. In fact, if you're familiar with Amazon, you know, the actual push to transition this came from the CEO, Jeff Bezos. There is no way this transition can happen in the organization if the leadership is not on the same page as the, technical, as the technical people. But if we decide that we have to do it because effectively the current architecture is preventing us from growing, from being productive, from scaling the business, then let's see what strategies we have in order to be able to approach this transition. We have to take this transition in a very, uh, from a very pragmatic standpoint. It's not nothing or everything. It's not zero to 100. It's a transitional process. It's a transitional process that will give confidence to the team as they keep pursuing it, that they can do it, and will give confidence to the leadership that as we do this transition, it's actually going to help the business. So there are three different strategies um, that I've identified to transition from monolith to microservices. The first one, I call it the ice cream scoop strategy. So imagine the monolith as being this large box of ice cream, and we scoop out services that now can live independently decoupled from the main code base. The second strategy is the legal strategy. Uh, we have our monoliths. Our monoliths is so large and so big and so complex, or perhaps there is no reason whatsoever to transition it. It keeps staying a monolith. We are not touching that monolith, that legacy monolith, but everything else we're going to be building is going to be built in a more modern architecture. So that uh, effectively is a basically you know, greenfield development built in a microservice rented architecture. The legacy stays, stays there, and we have to connect those two systems together. Then there is a third strategy, which is the nuclear strategy. Um, which means let's go, let's get away of, uh, get rid of the legacy monolith and let's transition everything into microservices, um, you know, from day one. Now, I've been working with top Fortune 500, top Global 5000 in this transformation. And my advice is to never go nuclear. It takes a lot of, how can I say, planning, responsibility into understanding really what are the limits, where is the line in the sand when we go nuclear, right? And most likely, that's not going to happen. We're going to be either over-engineering, going down a hole, and basically not, never get out of it. So I would recommend, um, and in this presentation I actually presented, the ice cream scoop strategy, which is the transitional, most pragmatic way, in my opinion, to transition to microservices. So let's look at the monolith. So this is the starting point. In a, in a monolith, in an object-oriented monolith, we have lots of, um, we have one code base, one large system, and we have um, basically lots of different objects that are being created in, uh, in our classes, basically. And these objects are communicating via each to each other via function calls. The function call, it's always going to work. The actual operation of in invoking the function call, it's always going to work because we leverage whatever system we're using, like for example, the Java virtual machine, to make sure that the function call, it's actually being received by a target class. Most likely we have one database or maybe more than one, but the idea is that the monolith is accessing the database and every class and object of the monolith can access the database. So if we think of a hypothetical marketplace, like, uh, you know, like Amazon.com, in a marketplace, what do we have? We have user management, we have order management, we want to see our invoices, we want to search the items that we can buy, and things like that. All of this, it's all into one code base. Now, obviously, there's going to be different teams that are going to be working in this monolith. And so, for example, team one, team two, and team three are all working together to make sure that the monolith keeps advancing over time. Now, there is a few problems with this as the mono monolithic application grows, and those are the classical and typical problems 
of monolith applications. Team 2, for example, that's just one of those problems. Team 2 starts making frequent changes to the code base, which requires lots of coordination with the other teams in order to, be in the, you know, to deploy this monolith and make sure that over time there's nothing that, that can break, because if something breaks, the entire monolith breaks. And so from a very pragmatic standpoint, we decide to adopt the ice cream scoop strategy. So we say, okay, you know what? If team two is being blocked by the other teams, if team two has to make so many changes in order to be able to scale the system and perhaps even grow the business, then how about team two runs on its own code base? And whatever team two is doing, the search, the inventory, the items, and the reviews process, which are high scale, for example, is going to be running separately in a separate code base. And this separate code base will access its own database and the information will be in flight between the traditional legacy and the new service. Very pragmatic. This is quite a big service still. It's not a small one. But this is what helps the business today. And so today, this is the best thing we can do in our systems, in our architecture, to make things better. The reason why we want to have separate databases is because we don't want one service to, for example, start making too many requests to the database bringing the database down, and then affecting the entire system. Now, by decoupling the database, if this code base does something wrong, it's not going to affect that other code base. So we want to decouple the access to our data in each service. But guess what? This is going to work for six months. It's helping the business. We now can scale our systems. But then there is something still wrong there. You know, one of these components, it's still very hard to scale and maintain and manage. So we go ahead and we decouple it. So now we have three different services. One that's bigger, it's our monolith. One that's a little bit, that one that's smaller, it's the search service. And one that's in between. And likewise, with the second transition, this third service, the search, will also have access to its own database. And we have to be very careful within our systems to share and propagate information in such a way that we don't create any inconsistencies within the application. As we keep doing these small transitions, we get a couple of things going on here. Number one, the way the teams are going to be working, even in a, in a simple use case like this, where we have three services, it's obviously going to be different compared to how they were working before. So by doing it gradually, we allow the teams to be able to learn how to better work together in a more decoupled, oriented way. As well as we give immediate benefits to the business because we're not going through a refactoring that's too deep, that takes too long. We're doing just what it's required to unlock that business scalability and get more searches, more people using our marketplace, and so on and so forth. It's a very pragmatic and gradual transformation. And like every transformation, like every you know, modernization, what this really is, it's a good old refactoring. We're taking a large code base, and we're refactoring it. And so before we even approach the transition, we have to take all the steps we usually take when we refactor our classes, when we refactor our functions, when we refactor our code bases. We have to understand what the code base we're trying to refactor does. If we don't know what it does, then how can we refactor into the first place? How can we draw the boundaries that we want to scoop out from the monolith? We have to have a clear understanding of who is consuming that monolith. If anything goes wrong in this transition, who are the players, the clients, that are going to be affected by this transition? So we have really to compartmentalize the transition to understand what are the dangers and you know, how can we perhaps even roll back if something goes wrong. But to do that, we need to know who are the clients that can potentially be affected by it. And there is no refactoring if you don't have tests. Right? At the end of the day, what we want here, it's a more scalable system that does not necessarily do something different than the monolith was doing, but it does it in a better way. So we have to have an integration test suite that allows us to make sure that as we're doing this transition, we're not breaking those clients. This 
it's not specific to microservices at all. This is a refactoring, you know, these are the traditional checklists for pretty much every refactoring. So we have to have this in place before we go ahead and refactor the monolith. Obviously, the situation is different if we're creating something new, something new that, you know, it's been born today because it's new, it doesn't have all of this, right? So we can be faster and quicker. Now, as we decouple our system, we do have to understand how to redirect existing traffic to these new services. That's very important. Um, most likely, we don't necessarily control the clients. For example, there's mobile apps that people have to update, or there's external partners that are consuming our system that have to be redirected across these new services we're building. We want to be decoupling the systems and have something at the top of that north-south traffic that's able to redirect the traffic wherever it has to go. And so we need to have a very smart load balancer. For example, this, uh, the front end is a, is a client, an example of a client, that has to go through there in order to consume the monolith. And API gateways, in this case, just happen to be very smart load balancers. So as we decouple our system, we can implement routing functionality that allows us to redirect the, the traffic from one place to another place. Ideally, not all the traffic will go to the new microservice or to the new service, but a subset of the traffic will go there. And then if that subset of traffic works well, then we start moving more and more. A typical canary release, we start moving more and more traffic into the new service. Ideally, the first step would be not even to redirect traffic. So the gateway, what it will do, it will duplicate the traffic into the new system just to make sure it works. But 100% of the production traffic will still go to the monolith. And then once the duplication of that traffic has shown no bugs or problems, then only then we might redirect, let's say, 5% or 1% of the production traffic there, and so on and so forth. Canary releases are becoming a very uh, important step in any microservice rented architecture. We're going to be creating new versions of our microservices. We're going to be adding more of them. We're going to be decoupling each one of them more and more over time. So from an operational standpoint, we cannot just execute a blue-green deployment to a new version. Because we have so many different components, we have to be able to intelligently broker that flow of information across each one of these different systems, each one of these different versions, in a different way that perhaps we were used to do in the monolith. So these are some of the operational changes that we'll have to implement in the organization as we transition to microservices. Some of these services might actually run in different clouds, in different platforms. Some of them will run in containers. So the organization will have to start thinking about, OK, how do we deal with hybrid platforms, and how do we deal with multi-cloud architectures? You know, multi-cloud doesn't happen necessarily because there is a top-down leadership decision to say, OK, starting from now on, we're going to be going multi-cloud. The enterprise, it, that's very rare. Uh, most likely, what's happening is having different teams choosing the right technologies to achieve their own productivity goals, their own business goals. And these teams are going to be running on whatever system and platform allows them to be successful. And so you'll have teams running on cloud number one or cloud number two, or running in a monolith or microservices architecture. And the enterprise will become hybrid, not because it wants to, but because it has to. The enterprise will then acquire some organizations, and these organizations will perhaps run in their own different clouds and so on. So the fact that the enterprise organizations become multi-cloud it's something that will naturally occur over time. Now, one of the questions that I, I hear more often is, you know, how big should these services be? And the reality is that they should be as big as they need to be in that specific moment in time to unlock that business goal, to unlock that team productivity. This is, you know, when we look at microservices, we look at this ideal uh, picture of every service perfectly sized and very small, but that's not the reality, that's not the use case. The reality is that the services are going to be as big as we need them to be. And we shouldn't be afraid of this. This is actually a very pragmatic way to think of this. The thing is, a big service can always be decoupled more and more over time in the future if that service creates some problems. But if we go all the way down to create them too small, we're not creating any tangible benefit 
And we're now turning this project from a very pragmatic project into an academic research project. So a big service can always be decoupled more and more in, a, in smaller ways moving forward. We don't have to go smaller or micro all the way through. All the way through. We, can be, we can choose intermediate sizes, whatever the boundary we're trying to extract demands. It can always get bigger, but it's very hard to go the other way around. And the network. The network is one of the biggest problems with microservice rental architectures. We said that um, information will be more and more in flight. More and more in flight means that we're going, to be be, we're going to be having a network in between all of these different services. In monoliths, we have objects, like we have seen before, interfaces, and function calls. We make a function call. We might disagree on the return value of the function call, but the actual invocation, we assume that's going to be working. Because, for example, the Java Virtual Machine will make that, uh, will assure us that that happens. But in microservices, those objects become services. And the services communicate to each other via network calls. And the network is the biggest variable we can introduce in any architecture. Why? Because the network is fundamentally unreliable. So we have to make the network reliable somehow. The network goes down. The network adds latency. The network implies a security conversation to have within the team, within the organization. The network is the biggest reason why microservice rental architectures fail, because if the network is not taken care of in the right way, then it will just break down. And so you might have heard of service mesh. Service mesh is a pattern which allows us to make that network reliable by introducing a new component, the data plane component which allows us to secure and protect and route and take care of errors in the network automatically without having to update our services. The services might even be built in different languages, so we might have different technologies. And the data plane allows us to not do that in, you know, reinvent the wheel over time, but just focus on the business logic that the service has to do and let the data plane handle that for us. In fact, if you want to have the best decoupling, we want to have a data plane running for each replica of each service, which means that that component, that data plane component, has to be extremely lightweight, because otherwise we're going to be running out of memory on the actual host. That's why uh, they call them sidecar proxies, because you want to run them um, on the same underlying virtual machine where the actual service is running. And then we'll have a control plane, which allows us to configure the entire system, because now we have so many data planes ar running around, as well as collecting metrics for observability and tracing from that system. Right. So service mesh helps us getting visibility, securing the network, and making that network reliable in the first place. Um, and then you can have a data plane as a north-south gateway as well. And basically, the gateway transitions to be this new data plane component which just becomes, like any other data plane, part of that mesh and allows clients from within the organization or outside the organizations to make requests. Um, you know, the data plane and control plane separation, it's very similar to uh, the nervous system. So the nervous system in our bodies uh, has a central nervous system in our brain and uh, per peripheral nervous systems in our, you know, in our bodies. And basically, the data planes are those peripheral nervous systems in our architecture that collects all of these requests, collects all of these inputs, and then allows the control plane to configure how those inputs should be treated. And, and this is what with Kong we're doing. Basically, we're providing that nervous system of the cloud. Right? So when it comes to Kong, uh, and I'll wrap this up, uh, we allow to manage the and regardless of Kong, whatever system we're using, we're going to be having these different architectures running. So we need to have something that allows us to hook into each one of them and get both configuration and observability metrics out of it in order to be successful with this transition. Right. So uh, to recap, uh, business transformation, do we need to move to microservices? And if we do need to move to microservices, let's do it in a pragmatic way. Let's not go all the way through in, a very, in an academic project, but let's do something that delivers business value today to the business and to the team, as well as adopting modern technology, which allows us to enable this transition in the first place. So a good choice of data planes, a good choice of control planes, which allows us to 
visualize what's happening in our architecture. Thank you.